Praise the Lord. All right. Thank you for that beautiful song. I was listening and praising God as I was hearing it. Wow, that's beautiful. Um, guess I better turn the microphone on, huh? Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Amen. We've got an all-star audio-visual guy back there. Chris is doing, he's remembering stuff that I typically forget. I forget. He's doing an excellent job. Praise God for um, those that the Lord sends us to help administer his congregation. Amen. Amen. Um, am I coming through okay? Yes. Amen. All right. What a beautiful day. <laughs> what a beautiful day to be alive. Amen. What a beautiful day to be able to say, thank you, Lord. Can I hear you say it? Thank I did not hear you. Thank Amen. Amen. It's that kind of day. Right? Thank you, God. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Oh, I love it. Well, beloved, <clears throat> here we are again on the last Sabbath of the month. And we're going to have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you <clears throat> for your presence in our congregation. Lord, we ask, oh Father God, I ask that you remove me and my carnal self from this pulpit, oh Father God, replace me with your spirit. Let the words that emanate from my mouth, oh Father God, be that which you would want your people to hear. Fill me with the divine capability, oh Father God, that goes far beyond what I'm able to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Here we are again. On the last Sabbath of the month, some of you might recall, some, we, kicked, uh, we kicked off the month of September, um, the first Sabbath of the month, we kicked it off with the message, Is God Particular? A message I was not able to complete. Some of you guys remember this. However, today the Lord has enabled the opportunity for us to continue and bring that message to a close. So this is, Is God Particular? Part 2. Now in review, beloved, some of you might remember that the focus of the message was and is an exploration. The focus of the message as we began last last uh, uh, at the beginning of the month was and is an exploration of the question does God really mean what he says is the all-powerful all-knowing creator of the universe imperative in his pronouncements some of you guys may remember where we were now there are indeed several passages in scripture that lead us precisely to the answer to this question one such place was our focus the last time we were together. And, and the example from the Bible was drawn from the unfortunate story of the mighty King Saul. Recall that the Bible tells us of an experience in 1 Samuel chapter 15 of a new king over Israel. See, up, up to that point, Israel had been a theocracy. I said, Israel had been a theocracy, and God was their leader. God was their king. But the Bible reveals that the people had become dissatisfied with the way things were going under the Lord, and thus they petitioned God for a human king, a carnal king, so that they could, so that they could be like other nations. Beloved, in this request, they were rejecting God. And yet God, in all his providence, decided to accommodate them in this woefully pagan desire. He demanded that this, that this newly installed earthly king be anointed and be committed 
to following spiritual guidance sent to him through the prophet of God, the prophet Samuel. Now, once installed as king, recall that one of the first things God wanted this, this new king to do, King Saul, was to pay a debt, repay a debt of vengeance from an offense against his people. Way back from the time of the great exodus from Egypt. You guys remember this? God promised in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 25, that judgment would surely fall upon the Amalekites. God had said to the Israelites, remember how when I brought you up out of the land of Egypt, these people, the Amalekites, fell upon the rear guard and they killed off the slow ones and the crippled ones. They, they killed off the old ones and the women and they took advantage in a cowardly manner. And God says way back then, I will repay. I will repay. And he commanded his people, the Israelites, not to forget. Now Saul is king, and he has his first assignment from God. I want you, Saul, to go down to the land of the Amalekites. Destroy everything down there, Saul, male, female, young, old, tall, short, indiscriminately. Now, some of this may be redundant because I'm reviewing from the last time I was here. You know, I learned from a great pastor that repetition deepens the impression. Amen? Amen. Moreover, God said, I want you, Saul, to destroy the cattle, and I want you to destroy the sheep. Everything that moves Saul is to die. The people you are to utterly destroy. For I have made you, Saul, my battle axe. Judgment has come. The God of heaven, the ultimate king, the king of kings, is executing judgment. And he will use his people Israel so that the fear of Israel will come upon all their enemies. God, through Samuel, made his way plain. And Saul went off with his soldiers. He went off merrily, and, and, and he went off promising to do exactly what God had said. He went off with a clear mind, you know. When you don't know any better, beloved, the Bible says in Acts chapter 17 and verse 30 that God winks at our ignorance. It's when we know. It's when God's will is clear and we deliberately disobey. That's when we're committing a most egregious sin against God, an offense called in Scripture iniquity, when we know. Amen? Now Saul went down into the land of the Amalekites, but when he got there, what did he see? He saw some things that he just did not expect to see. He saw some of the finest cattle he had ever seen before. They were healthy cattle and strong and fat cows and bulls. He looked over there and, and he saw that the sheep, oh man, they were prize winning sheep. So big, round, fluffy. And then he looked at the people and he saw that some of them were so very handsome and good-looking, professionals, you know, well-dressed and, and well-read. And, and then he looked at the king, and he began to make some decisions, you know. He decided that he's going to modify God's will. Did you hear that? He decided he's going to modify God's will. Saul made some decisions where he decided God had a good idea, you know, but, but he decided he can improve upon it. And then he began to rationalize. God will understand, he said to himself. Why, if he's as wise as, 
as we all believe that he is, then he'll understand my motives. He'll know I'm doing the, the best that I can, and, and he might even appreciate some of the new ideas that I'm bringing into the work. Amen? Saul is rationalizing. So King Saul said to his people, he said, go ahead and, and, set, set, and set aside that herd over there. And, and go ahead and set those sheep, put them over there. And, and, and let's let this one right here, that one can live. And, and, and that one over there, well, you know, that one probably going to have to die. And this one right here, this one could live. And, and, and that one over there, well, that's probably going to have to die. And, and whatever you do, guys, do not kill the king. Because after all, <clears throat> when we go marching back to camp, when we go marching back to camp, the women will be dancing in the streets. They'll be celebrating my victory. And if I can march back to the camp with the king of the Amalekites trailing behind me, oh, what great glory will that bring to me and my kingdom. And so Saul started out for home. And while he was on his way, God spoke to his prophet. Brothers and sisters, God doesn't always talk to kings because kings don't always listen. Kings are oftentimes caught up in political expediencies. Kings are always caught up in all sorts of civil matters, busy with this program and, and that program. The world needs a prophet, beloved. And God spoke through his prophet Samuel. God said, this very Saul, whom we set up and anointed, this very Saul, chosen by the people, this very Saul that promised to do exactly what I said is coming back now, Samuel, a disobedient servant. Samuel, I want you to go out and meet this man. And Samuel looked, and he saw a dust cloud on the horizon. It had gotten close, and he realized that King Saul was on his way. Samuel, the prophet of God, without the regal garments of the court, without a crown of any kind, this Samuel, whose only credentials were, thus saith the Lord, this Samuel walked down the road to meet the mighty King Saul. And as soon as King Saul saw him, he came a-running forward, gracefully, you know. And he met up with the prophet of God with a little insincere bow. Then he said to the prophet, listen, all that the Lord had commanded, I have fulfilled. This is what he said. And beloved, you ought to... You ought to read this story in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Saul says, all, or I have done all that God commanded. Now he's lying. But let me tell you something, friends. A person can decide to rationalize their disobedience. And he or she can persist in that thing to the point where they become so deceived that they don't realize what an offense to God they truly are. They'll expect God to accept it because they accept it. And when King Saul said, I have done all, he was sincere. How many times have we heard people say, all you got to do is believe. All you got to be is sincere. Well, yeah, but you got to be sincere about the right thing. I mentioned this before, that a man who's drowning will try and catch hold of anything to keep from dying. One man will take hold of a life buoy, and he's sincere. 
Another man will grab hold of a stone, and he's sincere. The difference is, one man's going to live, and the other man's going to die. Yet they're both sincere. You got to believe, and you got to follow the right thing. So when King Saul made his excuse, he had probably by this time rationalized and rationalized until he had convinced himself, I want to tell you right now, beloved, when God speaks, the best thing, the best thing to do is to take God at his word before we fall into the habit of trying to figure it out our way. We can talk ourselves right out of the family of God and right on into the porters of hell and it'll make sense to us every step of the way. Brothers and sisters, people don't seem to appreciate true prophets anymore, true messengers of God, those who preach a straight message. People seem to prefer prophets who fool them. They'll even make those prophets rich if they'll just feed them some nonsense and some fables. People somehow just don't cotton any longer to prophets, preachers, and teachers who are straightforward and who, who stay close by the word of God without equivocating. And, and so Samuel was, Samuel was my kind of man. He said to King Saul, and remember, Samuel is talking to a king. And ordinarily, you're supposed, to, you're supposed to bow and scrape to the king. And I imagine that's okay, as long as that king is in harmony with the word of God. But when God speaks, let every man be a liar, including his majesty. And so Samuel said, all right, Saul, king of the Israelites, you say you've done all that the Lord said. Now, if that's so, what meaneth the bleeding of the sheep in mine ears? And what about the lowing of the cattle that I hear, Saul? If you've done all that God said, what's this noise I hear, Saul? A cacophony of confusion coming from the throats of barnyard animals, Saul. What is this? But beloved, I want you to I want you to notice now the turn of Saul's language, how he's changing a little bit. As soon as he was caught by the prophet, he said, "Oh, oh, uh, 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 Samuel, uh, 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 they were the ones. Them, they were the ones." Well, yet when he expected the prophet Samuel to swallow his lie, he said, "I made the decision, but now it's they were the ones." Why, why, why prophet? They, they chose to spare the animals, but but don't misunderstand, Samuel. We're not planning. We're not planning to keep them. Oh, no. We're going to offer them up as sacrifices unto the Lord, you know. That's why we kept them. So we, we saved the, the fine, fat cattle, Samuel. And we, and we spared the fit, healthy sheep, you know. As a matter of fact, Samuel, I even had my men to examine all these animals. And guess what, Samuel? They're without spot or blemish. Yeah. Just the way we do it here in Israel. They may come from down there, but they're just like, they're just like ours right here at home, Samuel. And we're planning, to, we're planning to offer them up, give them up to the Lord as a sacrifice. Isn't that great, Samuel? Rationalize it. I tell you, friends, there are some prophets you can fool, but you cannot fool the one that's doing what God says. You cannot fool the one that's obeying the God of the universe. 
I like the way Samuel talked to King Saul. He said, had the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Do you think God needs animal sacrifices and your offerings, Saul? Behold, says the prophet of God, to obey, what did I say? Obey. To obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken than the fat of rams. Is God particular? Does he mean what he says? Listen, beloved, we're not doing God a favor when we decide, when anybody decides to follow Jesus Christ. We're doing ourselves a favor. God doesn't, God doesn't need us. He's God. Oh, he loves us abundantly. But we need to understand, the world needs to understand that he is God. God doesn't need our burnt offerings. He doesn't need our 20, our 50, our $100 bills in the collection plate. What the Lord desires, beloved, is our hearts, is our commitment to his will, is our obedience. Because when God has that, he has every other thing about us. And that's when, that's when he can use us for his glory. And the prophet, the prophet Samuel said, Saul, do you think God is moved by money? Some people think God is impressed by money. Do you think God is moved by money? Do you think you can soften the voice of the prophet of God with money, Saul? Do you think you can take the scourge out of the hand of the prophet of God with an offering, Saul? Saul, do you think God up there in heaven is ameliorated and mollified with burnt offerings and sacrifices? Do you think he needs those sacrifices? All the blood offerings do anyhow, Saul. Listen to this. All the blood offerings do anyhow, Saul, is remind God the Father of the fact that one day he'll have to watch his only begotten son suffer and die on the cross. For sins he did not commit. That's all those blood sacrifices do, Saul. Remind the Father. Is God, is God particular? I believe the story of King Saul in that story is the answer to that question. If you continue to read, you know that King Saul lost that kingdom. And God elevated and anointed a man more worthy. So is God particular? You better believe it. <laughs> and then there's the story of the Philistines. You know, the Philistines, the enemy of God's people, taking the ark of the Lord. This was not Noah's ark, mind you. This was the ark of the covenant, the most sacred vessel in all of Israel. And it was kept in the sanctuary, in the temple, in the most holy place. A chest about 55 inches long, about 33 inches square, made of something called shittim wood, overlaid with gold it was. It had a lid, you know, a lid it's called the mercy seat, which was made of solid gold. You can read about this. Now this ark, so meticulously constructed, it was essentially a box. It was a container, right? What was placed inside was the real treasure. Inside the box, the ark set, sat the Ten Commandments of God, written with the finger of God on two tables of stone. If you understand that, say amen. amen. 
after the commandments were put inside the ark, the mercy seat was placed on top. Two golden angels were on either sides of the mercy seat, called the covering cherub. There was a light emanating from between them, the holy Shekinah. Well, this holy Shekinah represented the visible presence of the living God. Is God particular? Now, because of the sacredness of this vessel and what it represented, God was quite particular in how it was to be handled. And he said through the writings of his servant Moses and through the prophets thereafter, he said this, God said this, God said this, no man is to touch the ark lest he die. Brothers and sisters, that's clear. It's quite hard to stumble over that. God didn't say, do not touch unless. God didn't say, do not touch except. He didn't say, do not touch save for. God said, do not touch lest ye die. I mentioned before, beloved, that back in those days, wars between nations, countries, were generally not only political contests, be, not only political contests, but they were also religious contests as well. Wars in those days were contests between gods. Did you hear that? They were contests between gods. And the, and the Philistines, the enemy of God's people, they had a god. His name was Dagon. What did I say? Dagon. Dagon. Now, the Israelites' god, you know, his name was Jehovah God. And Jehovah God dwelt between the covering cherub, atop the mercy seat, in the most holy place. So the word had gone around that above the mercy seat, and let me just tell you, friends, I thank God that between an offended law and a just God, there is mercy. Amen. Say amen. amen. So the word had gone out that above the mercy seat dwelt the living God. Now the Philistines had fought many times against the Israelites. And many times those Philistines were defeated. But then came a battle, a battle where the Philistine army appeared to triumph. And they went in there, into the temple of God, and they, those rascals, stole the very sacred Ark of the Covenant. The little rascals, they carried it back home to their land in great triumph. Now when they got there, they thought to themselves, <laughs> Our God, Dagon, has prevailed over their God, Jehovah. And so they took the Ark of the Lord inside their temple, where was a statue of their God, Dagon. And they proceeded to place the Ark of the Lord in front of Dagon. And since Dagon was a tall God and the Ark was only 33 inches high, it gave the appearance of the God of Jehovah paying homage to their God, Dagon. Oh, they celebrated a great victory down there in the land of the Philistines. Festival. And eventually, the celebration ended for the night. And the people retired to rest and sleep at their homes. Yet, the celebration was to continue the next day. So when they all returned to their temple, the temple of Dagon, the next day to continue the celebration, behold, Dagon, their great and powerful God, had fallen flat on his face in the presence of the ark of the Lord. Lord, have mercy. How did that happen? Not only that, beloved, 
But a plague had broke out amongst the Philistines. I said a plague broke out amongst the, the Philistines and they began to die. Well, eventually these Philistines, they came to the senses. <clears throat> now these were heathens, beloved. And the leaders got together and said, look, we, we got this thing down here. But I got to tell you, it's too hot for us. We bought this ark down here. And we thought we could celebrate a great victory and, and show it off and, and get a little glory for ourselves. But look, our God has already fallen on its face. And look, our, our people are, are dying. We better get this thing back to where it belongs. So they sent word to King David. They sent word to King David. You can read about this, beloved. Come and get it. <laughs> we, we don't want it. Come and get it. <laughs> it's causing us too much misery. Come and get it. Our economy is suffering with this thing down here. Come and get it. Our army is facing defeat. Come and get it. Sickness has broken out all over our land. David, come and get this thing and get it out of here. And the Bible says, listen to this. David got together 30,000 men to go out, go down, and get the ark of the Lord. And if you read it, the Bible says David not only gathered up these 30,000 men, but it says that David sent singers and musicians. You see, David must know that if you have the right kind of music, if you got spiritually uplifting music, it'll get you into the right frame of mind for worship. It'll call you to the foot of the cross if you have the right kind of music. And David must have known this. So David got together his musicians. And not only singers, but the instrumentalists as well. David got his band together and he stretched these people out in parade formation. They're going to march down to bring home the ark of the Lord and they're going to do it without lifting a sword. Lord have mercy. And you know the heathen would gather on the hillside and they would say, how great is this King David? And how great is their God? When they got down there, beloved, those Philistines were mighty glad to see him coming. Who would have thought it? <laughs> Every other time they seen King David, they were pulling out their swords for battle. Not this time. This time, they were willing to bow. Can you believe it, beloved? They were willing to bow, even willing to pay some offerings. We'll make a donation, David, if you just get this thing out of here. Now, the Bible says, David came and took the ark. Well, don't miss this, beloved. Don't miss this. David took the ark and put it on an ox cart. That was his mistake right there. I'll get back to that in a moment, but that was his mistake. But he took the ark and he put it on an ox cart. And I can just see David and these Israelites. In my imaginations, I can see him as he, as he thanks and shakes hand with the leaders of the Philistine people, he turns around and gives the signal, 30,000 plus. And the band got started. And it must have been something to hear them play. And oh, it must have been something to hear the choir sing. 
And as they, as they were playing, the men were in high blood, y'all. And they got in step. And they goaded the oxen and started back to Jerusalem. With the ark of the Lord. And 30,000 celebrating. And people, can you imagine, standing on the hillsides, observing, oh, what a time it must have been. But the Bible says they came to Achan's threshing floor. Where did they come? Where did they come? Achan's threshing floor. That's important, beloved. The Bible says they came to Achan's threshing floor. There were two men assigned to drive the ox cart. One's name was Uzzah. And the other's name was Ahio. One's name was Uzzah, and the other's name was Ahio. They were driving the ox cart, and they were going on along <clears throat> when they came to Achan's threshing floor. The Bible says the ox cart stumbled. This, is, this story is found in 1 Chronicles, beloved. The ox cart stumbled, and now I need to explain what I, what I meant when I said that it was their mistake, David's mistake, placing that ark on the ox cart. The Philistines took the, they took the ark home to their land on an ox cart. They took the ark home to their land on an ox cart. Listen to this. They didn't know any better. They didn't know any better. They didn't have the word of God. You know, beloved, there are people doing the best thing that they can. They're doing what they know to be done. And God respects those decisions because they don't know the word. The times of their ignorance, God winks at that. But then, beloved, after the word comes, we can't do business as usual. After the word comes, we can't hang out in the streets like worldly folk. After the word comes, you can't go where worldlings go. After the word comes, you, got, you, you can't go out to the riverboats anymore. After the word comes, you can't sit at the bar with your drinks. After the word comes, the nightclubs ain't the place for you. After the word comes, God's word to his people Israel was, whenever you carry the ark of the Lord, let the priests pick it up. Let the priests pick it up. And even then, they weren't supposed to touch it. You know what? It had, these, it had these rings on the side, you see. And there were these long poles that slid through the rings. And the priests were, the priests were to take hold of the poles and lift that thing up onto their shoulders. Right? Now I digress here for a moment, beloved, and remind everyone that inside that box, that container, the Ark of the Lord, were the Ten Commandments. You see, God has always wanted his preachers, preachers of his word, to lift up his law. God wants preachers to be foremost in raising his commandments high up to a level of respectability. God expects the ministers to be foremost in exalting his law rather than always condemning it telling congregations for centuries that it was nailed to the cross. No, no. Why would God nail thou shalt not steal to the cross? And tell me this, why would God nail thou shalt not commit adultery to the cross? Why would God nail thou shalt not murder to the cross? Why would God nail thou shalt not lie to the cross? 
Oh no, beloved. Yet millions of unspecting Christians today are trying their best to ignore the holy moral law of God. And the preachers, instead of lifting it up, are carrying God's sacred holy law on an ox cart of disrespect and shameful contempt. God says to Israel, now we're talking about his people now, you know, because everybody can do what God says. But the Lord's got to have some people out here today who ought to. God says to his people, when you handle the law, when you handle sacred things, I want the priests first to reach down and lift it up and raise it up high. And if the priest would lift up my word, then the congregations would follow. God told them how to do it. He told his people how to do it. Not with an ox cart, but with the priests. But they tried to do it the way the Philistines did it. And that's how they got in trouble. That is how they got into trouble. The Bible says, when they came to Achan's threshing floor, the ox cart stumbled. Don't miss this. The oxen stumbled, and brothers and sisters, the most sacred vessel in all of Israel was sitting on that cart. And when the oxen stumbled, they jerked and they jolted. I imagine a couple wheels may have flown up in the air. And that, that sacred vessel, that vessel which, which was so delicate and so precious with all that fine gold, that vessel where the presence of God rested all those years, that vessel riding on an ox cart teetered and it appeared as though it was about to fall to the ground. And the Bible says, at that very moment, perhaps without even thinking, Uzzah, who did I say? Uzzah. Uzzah, one of the drivers, he must have reached out his hand without even thinking to steady the ark. Wait a minute. Hold on a minute. Let's not rush past this. I said the ox cart stumbled. And it appeared that the most sacred vessel in all of Israel was about to fall to the ground. One of the drivers, his name was Uzzah, without even thinking, he must have reached out. This man, Uzzah. This man, Uzzah, meant well, wouldn't you say? They tell me that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. This man, Uzzah, he didn't mean any harm, would you say? Why, if anybody should have been able to say, the Lord will understand. It should have been us, amen? Here's a man who had the idea that he could give God a hand. This man thought, why, it would be a shame for something like this to happen. It would be a shame for that precious golden ark containing the sacred law of God to hit the ground. If I could just hold on to it for a moment, I could just, I could, I could spare God all the embarrassment of this sacred vessel falling to the ground. And not only that, the law inside might break again. You know it broke before. It might break again. Can you, can you, can you hear us thinking? The law inside might break again. And not only that, the box itself might fall apart. And not only that, <clears throat> those golden angels might get dented, you see. So I know that others' motives were good. And God will understand. So Uzzah reached out and he touched it. But God had said, who? God had said, no man touch the ark lest he die. 
Who out there would dare say that God doesn't mean what he says? Who out there would dare say that he's not a particular God with his pronouncements? Who out there would rationalize that he or she can do it his way and still go to heaven? You know, Cain had it screwed on that way. Did you hear that? Cain had it screwed on that way, thinking he could stand before the great God of the universe and do things his way. Who out there would dare believe that they could follow what seems right to them in their own eyes and still please God? There's a proverb in the Bible, beloved, which says that there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Mm -hmm. If you know God's will, you better do God's will. If you understand God's word, you better obey God's word. Amen? Somebody might say, oh, Andre, hold on a minute. Suppose that ark had fallen and hit the ground. My answer is, suppose it, suppose it had. If God cared that much about it, he could protect it. Yeah. If the Lord were that concerned about the safety of the ark, he'd have it so it, so it fell on a clump of moss or, 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 or some kind of soft grass or even a pile of fine sand or something like that, if God was that concerned. In fact, <laughs> God wouldn't have even had to do that. He's God. All he would have had to do is blink his eyes. And check this out, guys. That ark would have stopped in midair. It would have stopped in midair and waited there until a priest got there to put it back where it belonged. Isn't that something? That's God. We're not supposed to do God's part. We're not supposed to do it our way. We have a responsibility to do our part. I read somewhere that in all of God's biddings and all of God's enablings, he never asks us to do what can't be done through his power. If God tells you to jump through that wall, it's your business to get up and jump through that wall, and it's his business to open up a hole so you can get to the other side. Amen? Amen? God doesn't need our help. His concern is our hearts and our obedience to his will. God will never ask us to do what we cannot do through his power. We don't have to worry about God's part. Let us focus on what God tells us to do. What do you say, church? Amen. The man, Uzzah, died right there. And the Bible says King David was afraid of God that day. You know, there's some folks running around here today Scared to hear a sermon on the second coming of Jesus Christ. There are people running around scared of God like he's an enemy. I love that song that we sing. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs he'll bear. Jesus is not an enemy. He's a friend. We ought always, always, be glad to see a friend coming, amen? amen? We ought to always be glad to see this friend coming. You know why? Because when this friend comes, he's going to put an end to suffering. When this friend comes, he's going to put an end to oppression. When this friend comes, he's going to put an end to hatred. When this friend comes, He's going to put an end to racial division. And he's going to deal justly with those who make it an industry sowing dissension and discord amongst God's people. The Bible says there are six things that the Lord hates. Yea, seven are an abomination. And the seventh is sowing um, discord amongst the brethren. God hates that. And he'll deal with those who make an industry of that. When this friend comes... He'll put an end to sickness and suffering and disease. 
When this friend comes, everything is going to fall in line. Wars are going to cease. Trouble will be no more. We can bury our weapons when this friend comes in the sands of time and study war no more. When this friend comes, who in their right mind wouldn't be glad to see Jesus Christ come? I'll tell you who. I tell you who doesn't want to see him come. Who, who, won't, who does not want to see him burst through the clouds? Beloved, it's the person who isn't ready. The person who isn't ready. King David was afraid of God. Why? Because there's been a, there had been a, a breach of conscience, a breach of God's word. God said, do it this way. And they followed the Philistines. You don't have to be afraid, beloved. We do. When you're doing what God says, there's no need to be afraid. I'm reminded of a speech. I'm reminded of a speech by the great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And we're going to close out. Years ago, some of you guys may remember this. Standing in a little church that night, the night before his assassination, he stood in that little church and Martin Luther King Jr. announced to the, to the world on television, he said, I'm not fearing any man. I'm not afraid indeed. I'd like to live a long time for longevity has its place. <clears throat> but he said, I'm not concerned about that right now. I just wanna do God's will. I'm not fearing any man. In fact, the only time I'm scared of anything is when there is a breach of conscience. But when I'm, but when I'm, When I'm walking with the Lord, I'm not scared of any man. I'm not scared of kings. And, and I'm not, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Why should we fear? When he who is all-powerful, is walking by our side. Our fear is to fear sin and to fear evil's influence upon our lives and to fear rebellion that may creep into our hearts. For the Bible says rebellion is as the sin of rich witchcraft. Oh, beloved, there are so many, many more examples in God's word. Is he particular? Does he mean what he says? You can surely believe that our God, our great awesome God, the God in heaven is indeed particular and means exactly what he says. So what would King Saul say about it? How about sincere little Uzzah? What would he say about the words of God? Our God is indeed, he's a particular God. I could go on and on and on, beloved. But if God has spoken to you clearly through this message this day, and if, and if you believe now that God means what he says, I mean every bit of what he says, every teensy, weensy bit of what he says. If you believe God does not shuck and jive when it comes to his word, <clears throat> then stand with me. Join me as we sing our closing song in prayer and in praise. Until then, 632.